Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight to the first seminar of our uh, science series seminars sponsored by the SCT department here at Thomas uh, Nelson Community College. Uh, Dr. Kuchina couldn't be here, and uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Robert Michaels from Jefferson Lab. Uh, Dr. Michaels got uh, his uh, PhD uh, in 1989 from Yale University um, with a thesis in elementary particle physics. From 1989 to 1993, he did postdoctoral research um, at uh, CERN, the European Center for Nuclear Research in uh, Genova, Switzerland, for four years. And then he came to uh, Jefferson Lab as a staff scientist in 1993, uh, where he does nuclear physics research and explores fundamental forces between constituents of matter. Uh, Dr. Michaels is a spokesperson and co spokesperson on five experiments at Jefferson Lab, and he has um, co authored over 120 uh, papers <coughs> and publications in referred journals. Um, he mentors graduate students, undergraduate students, coordinates collaborations, and proposes new, uh, new experiments. And since 2005, he has been uh, teaching one course per semester as an adjunct faculty here at Thomas Nelson Community College. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Michaels tonight and uh, uh, enjoy the talk. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about jobs and science and give you an introduction to Jefferson Lab. Uh, what's shown here on the uh, screen is, a, <clears throat> is an aerial view of Jefferson Lab. Uh, it consists of two linear accelerators which are underneath the ground and they accelerate electrons to a high energy and then the electrons are put into experimental halls which are also underground and you have these three uh, mounds of dirt which, uh, which, ha which, which uh, house these experimental halls. And there's a fourth one being built uh, up on the top. This is a picture when it was under construction. So I work in experimental hall A. Uh, this is another aerial view of the accelerator complex at Jefferson Lab. And it has these three halls, A, B, and C. And over here on the top right is an artist's view of Hall A with the equipment in it, which I'll explain a little bit more in, in a minute. And then this is a um, fisheye photograph of that equipment. It's a little hard to see how big it is, but a person would be about that big. So now I'm going to explain what I do. Uh, I do research in nuclear physics. and uh, the idea is that matter is made out of atoms, which in turn uh, consist of nuclei that are surrounded by electrons. And the nuclei contain three quarks. The quarks and the electrons are considered to be fundamental particles, which means that they can't be subdivided. And so this is a, a view of uh, what matter is made out of. And what we study in nuclear physics is the forces between the quarks and how they arrange themselves in matter. So the science at Jefferson Lab aims to understand in detail the structure of matter by probing the quarks in nuclei. And to perform this study, we use an atom smasher and detectors. Together, these form a kind of microscope. So this is an artist's rendition of what uh, three quarks and a proton would look like. That's a kind of fuzzy picture. And the quarks can be treated as fundamental, so there are mathematical points that enter into the theory. <coughs> so the question I'd like to ask first is, how can we obtain experimental information about nuclei? 
why do we need a place like Jefferson Lab? What does it do? So I'm going to go through a kind of stepwise procedure of what we do. There'll be five steps in total. Step one is you have to produce an electron beam. And this picture shows uh, the electron accelerator. And it has these microwave cavities, a little bit like a microwave oven, but they're very powerful. And the electrons, which are represented by a little smiley here, are pushed to higher and higher energies by the microwaves, which are electromagnetic waves. So they get accelerated by them. One way to think of this is that the electrons are kind of like a surfer riding a wave, and the wave pushes the surfer to higher energy. Step two, you have to take those electrons and smash them into a target. And it's the quarks in the target that we're trying to study. So here's a target. This happens to be cryogenically cool helium. So you cryogenically cool it to get a very high density. And then you bring the electron beam in and scatter from the target. Step three is you want to detect the scattered debris. And you do that in things called spectrometers. So in Hall A, we have these two spectrometers. And the electron beam comes in here. The properties of the beam are measured by some equipment here. You need to know the energy and the position of the beam and things like that. It hits the target, and then you look at what scatters out. So electrons may scatter out, or you may knock out a proton or some other particle like a pion or a kaon. This is a picture of these spectrometers uh, in Hall A. And these machines you can think of as kind of a microscope for looking at the quarks. Another picture of the spectrometers. And uh, here are some of the collaborators who work on experiments uh, at Jefferson Labs. So you can get an idea of how big the apparatus is compared to these people. Uh, we have about 1,500 physicists who work there from different parts of the world, and the uh, scientists in-house at about 200. So what do the spectrometers measure? Well, this is, first of all, a picture of the spectrometer. It consists of some magnets of different types. This is a quadrupole magnet, another quadrupole, and a dipole, and then, uh, finally, another quadrupole. So using the magnets, you can measure the momentum, because you look at how the electron or other particle bends, and by measuring the bend, you can determine the momentum of that particle. And then we have these detectors, which, uh, when the apparatus is running, are inserted in the shield hut, and those identify what kind of particles you have that have scattered out. And finally, you measure the direction that the, the scatter has has uh, gone, so you measure the outgoing angle, and you can vary the angle of the spectrometer by rolling it around um, to different angles, seeing what comes out at different angles. So that's what you actually measure. Step four is you have to detect the particles. So you have particle detectors, and they determine what kind of particles come out of the target. Um, so what they pick apart the scattered debris and tell what you have is an electron, a proton, or something else. And this is an artist's view of the detector stack. Uh, these detectors, uh, there are different kinds that are, are put in there, and uh, the technology is always improving, and sometimes it has uh, spin-offs. For example, uh, some medical imaging technology has come out of Jefferson Lab. So the fifth and last step would be the physics. Uh, by that I mean you have to interpret the results. So the measurement results in publishable new information, which can be compared to other measurements and to theories. And the results may end up in the textbooks someday, or may not. <coughs> so let me give you an analogy to what we do. This, this is not what we do at Jefferson Lab, but this is just to give you the idea Suppose you wanted to do experiments that study the structure of crystals. For example, you want to know the structure of DNA. What kind of things could you do? Well, here's one experiment. You could 
shoot an electron beam, you make the electrons by heating a filament and then accelerating the electrons through some voltage, and the electrons hit a target, some of them backscatter, and then you have a detector, and you move the detector around to see how the intensity of what you see uh, varies with this angle phi. That's one thing you could do. Another experiment you could do would be pass the beam through some material. And you look at what comes out the other side. This is an intensity pattern that you see. And this is another kind of pattern you might see. Uh, this would be for a regular crystal. This would be for a powder of crystals. So how would you explain the data? Well, it's a long history. But basically, this gives you information where you can deduce the three-dimensional crystal atom structure. And things like this, as I've said, were done to understand how DNA is structured. Now, at Jefferson Lab, we do something kind of similar. As I said, it's an analogy. But we're studying nuclei, not crystals. Actually, these experiments you could almost do with Thomas Nelson because you just need a few kilovolts to make an electron beam. There'd be some safety issues with making the beam, but you can kind of imagine doing it. But the difference between this and Jefferson Lab is that to study nuclei, you need energies that are like a million or several million times as high. And that's why you need a huge machine. Because basically, the, the higher the energy of the probe, the smaller the distance scale that you're able to measure. Or probe. So we're looking at scattering of high energy electrons in this particular data. It's about 500 million electron volts. And the electrons are scattered from lead, lead nuclei. So the lead nuclei are the mysterious structures which cause a pattern in the scattered electrons. This is the experiment I'm thinking of. The electrons come in, they hit a lead foil, they scatter at some angle can go into the detector, and you can vary the angle of this detector, you can vary the energy of the beam. Uh, if you had a magnet in here, you could look at, uh, you could momentum analyze the electrons coming out, so you could look at their momentum. But this is, you know, in the simplest version, what we're looking at. And then, what's shown here in the data is the scattering rate on the vertical axis versus the angle. It's actually the momentum transfer, but the momentum transfer is related to the angle. And you can see this pattern where uh, there's some undulation in the rate. It's also quite beautiful data because it goes over many orders of magnitude and it's extremely precise. Now, how do you explain this pattern? Well, the simplest explanation would be to, uh, to give you the size of the nucleus. So from the size of the nucleus, you can deduce this pattern. So I chose this data even though it's kind of old data, it's from two labs that were precursors of Jefferson Lab. Saclay was a lab in uh, France, and they made these measurements in the 1970s. Stanford, the lab at Stanford is closed in the meantime. They made these kind of measurements in the 60s. So it's a mature field, and you might ask yourself, how can we uh, learn something new? If you've got this data, why would you want to take more? So that's the question now, what new physics is explored at Jefferson Lab. So I'm just going to give you one example, and the example is working in the field where I, um, where I work, which is to use the weak nuclear interaction. Now the weak inter nuclear interaction is one of the fundamental interactions, but it's not uh, it's not part of common experience because it's it's uh, it's only acting on the size scale of a nucleus. It's only recently been understood, I would say within my lifetime, because when I was working on a PhD, uh, the PhD project was one of several experimental efforts at the time to uncover what was the correct theory of the weak nuclear interaction. But in the meantime, it's been pretty well understood, and it's been unified with the electric and magnetic forces. So there's a, a unified theoretical framework for those forces. And so since it's been understood fairly well, it can be used as a new probe of nuclear matter. So this is an example of what we do that's new. How would you isolate the weak interaction? Uh, it turns out that the weak interaction looks different uh, when, you, when, you look, when you do two experiments which are mirror images 
of each other. So you want to do two experiments that are mirror images. The weak interaction will look different, but the competing electromagnetic interaction, which is a lot larger, will look the same. So if you subtract the two experiments, you can pull out the part that's from the weak interaction. So the weak interaction changes with a mirror imaging, and that allows you to isolate it. And the way you make a mirror imaging is you use what's called a spin of the electron. So the electron is moving, but it's also spinning. And if you flip the direction of the spin, that's like looking at a mirror, um, a mirror image. And it's shown by that diagram in the top right. So you take positively spinning electrons, <coughs> call this positive, where they're aligned with the momentum, and flip that to negatively spinning electrons, so the spin of the electron slips, but the momentum is not. And you look at the difference in the scattering rate. So the method is to slip the spin of the electrons and look for a different scattering rate. Which sounds pretty simple, but and uh, you'll see here in a second that it's, it's pretty hard to do it precisely. So let me explain how you have to make, how do you make electrons that spin. So technically what you do is you take a laser beam, which is polarized, and you put it through a Pockel cell which can change the orientation of the polarization of the beam. And that gets a gallium arsenide crystal, electrons come out of the crystal from the laser beam, and the electrons have a spin. So the polarization of the laser beam is transferred to the polarization to the spin of the electron beam. Now when you flip the spin, you have to be very careful because you don't want to change anything else. For example, you don't want to change the position of the beam. If you change the position of the beam and look at the difference, you wouldn't be studying the weak interaction, you'd just be studying something that, caused, that was caused by the position change. So the electromagnetic interaction depends on the uh, angle of the beam coming in, and you have a systematic error. So for doing, for doing these experiments, you need to control the position to a level of about 1 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. And that required technological breakthroughs, which uh, can only be done in a place like Jefferson Lab. So to recap, the experiment involves flipping the spin and counting the number of scattered electrons in each spin state. And we look in both detectors for both spectrometers. They're both counting the electrons that have scattered from the target. And here are the electrons coming in. So a fairly simple concept, you're just looking for the difference um, in the scattering rate. I may have skipped the slide. No, I guess not. So I'm going to talk about uh, a specific example of this. There's actually several experiments that use the weak interaction, and this is one of them. Um, I'm going to talk about this experiment called P-Rex. Uh, so the reason for the word P-Rex is we're measuring radius of lead, and the symbol lead starts with T, and then EX is for experiment. So T-Rex. And then, of course, it's a play on the word T-Rex, where the mascot is a, it's actually not a T-Rex, but it's close to a T-Rex, and it's trying to measure the size of its nucleus. So we're trying to measure the size of the nucleus with the weak interaction. I'm going to talk about what T-Rex measures, and the result, and the implications for other fields. If you're interested, here's a website, and on the website, one of the things is a, uh, explanation for the problem. Okay, so we're looking at this parity violating asymmetry in the scattering rate. That's what we measure. So it's defined as the difference divided by the sum of the scattering rate for right and left handed spins. And that's going to be on the order of one part in a million, so 10 to minus 6. Uh, it arises from the interference between the electromagnetic exchange and the weak Z boson exchange. So this is the electromagnetic interaction, Z boson. I should explain that the way you model interactions quantum mechanically is you have an amplitude, and there's a mathematical expression for this amplitude, and then the square of the amplitude gives you um, the rate. So this asymmetry arises from this Z naught exchange, which is the weak force. 
Now, you can see why the weak force is useful from this table. Uh, the electric charge in the units of the proton charge, for the proton is one, the neutron is neutral. So if you wanted to use the electric, electromagnetic interaction to see where neutrons are, it doesn't work very well because the neutrons are, have no charge, so you can't really see where they are. <clears throat> for the weak charge, it's kind of the opposite. For the proton, the weak charge is not quite zero, but about 13 times smaller than the weak charge for the neutron. So that means that the z naught of the weak interaction sees the neutrons. So that's the advantage it has. It can see where neutrons are. So I'll just come to the result of the experiment. We were measuring the size of this lead nucleus. So what I've drawn here is a kind of picture of the nucleus. And in the interior, you have neutrons and protons. But it's thought for a long time that in, uh, since there are more neutrons, that they would form a kind of skin around the nucleus. So this region in blue is neutron rich. Maybe not neutron only, but neutron rich. So this neutron scan, first of all, it was expected theoretically because there's simply more neutrons than protons. And the PRX experiment observed it. So in terms of statistics, there's a 95% confidence level. You can improve that by increasing the statistical accuracy. And we're planning to come back and make more measurements to increase the statistical accuracy. Now this measurement was a lot cleaner than using other probes. You could try using proton scattering, for example. Um, but the interpretation of those probes is a lot more difficult. And it forms a fundamental check of nuclear theory. Again, this is the website on the bottom right. So I'm not quite finished with PRX. Let me talk about applications. Now, there are no practical applications that I can think of. You can't use the weak interaction to build a better toaster oven or something. But there are applications in other, other fields of, of physics, basically where you need to know neutrons, know, know about neutrons. So one of them is neutron stars. And the physics of, that's of interest here is, first of all, what's the nature of extremely dense matter? Uh, the neutron star is the most dense visible form of matter. The black hole would be more dense, but for the visible matter, the neutron star is the most dense. Uh, maybe you know when stars collapse, they can form, they, they can, they can uh, collapse into one of three states, depending on the mass of the star. If it's a light star, like the sun, it'll, uh, it'll end up as a white dwarf. And for a sort of medium mass star, about 1.4 to maybe 2 times the mass of the sun, uh, it'll have a supernova explosion, and at the end, it ends up as a neutron star, which is mostly neutrons. If it's more massive than 2 times the mass of the sun, it'll end up as a black hole. So the neutron stars, this is uh, an example of one of them. What's actually shown here is the Crab Nebula, and the cloud is the, a remnant of a supernova explosion, and the neutron star is a little rock that's in the middle there. The rock is about the size of Norfolk. But it's visible because it emits radiation. Uh, these, these are different uh, forms, di different views of the same thing in different wavelength region, regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Another physics question then is, when these stars collapse, are they really a neutron star or is it something more exotic? For example, it could be a, a quark star or a, a so-called strange star. So neutron stars need to know about neutron-rich matter, and that's where PREX helps. Uh, this is a kind of picture of the theory behind neutron stars. There's quite a bit of theory behind it. So the inputs you need, one input you need is the equation of state. If you've been studying uh, ideal gas law, PV equal nRT, it's kind of like that equation. So it's an equation about the state of, of the matter. So in, in particular, you need to know that pressure is a function of density for neutron-rich matter. And that's where PRX helps. Once you know that equation, you can actually compute 
the structure of the star, and you can then compare it to astrophysics observations, which include how brightly does the star shine, uh, what is its temperature, and what is its mass. So by comparing the theory to the observations, uh, you test the theory. So that's all I have to say about PREX. Uh, I have a couple other slides to go over. One question I have is just some thoughts about why it's, it's good to do science. Historically, we didn't do very much. Like back when uh, Benjamin Franklin was doing his work, uh, he was able to do science in large part because he was wealthy. He also happened to be a very smart person. So he did some fundamental experiments on electricity. Uh, but outside of universities, there wasn't very much science done. They didn't have big labs like Jefferson Lab. But World War II taught governments the value of supporting science. Uh, for example, uh, radar was developed around that time. It was found to be very useful. And I think you all know the story of the atom bomb. So after World War II, uh, the support for science ramped up significantly around the world. Science environments like Jefferson Lab are also valuable because they teach students the scientific method. Scientific method is an approach to solving problems. It's a way of thinking in an evidence-based way and analyzing things. So those students, not all of them stay in research, but a lot of them go into industry or education or government. So it's a training ground for students. The third bullet is that there are technological spin-offs like medical imaging that I mentioned earlier. But I think the main reason why you want to support science is the long-term investment in the future. So any given research direction is uncertain. You don't know how it's going to pay off. But it might pay off, for, for example, studying the weak interaction. Could there ever be a practical application? Well, I can't, I can't imagine one right now. But who knows? And a good example of that would be the research that was done in electromagnetism in the 1800s. Uh, which now has led to radio, television, electronic devices, cell phones, lasers, and so forth. These couldn't have happened without scientific research. That's, that's all I would say about why we do science. And I was asked to talk about jobs in science, so let me mention a few things about jobs at Jefferson Lab. This is my last slide. Uh, if you're interested in, in information about employment, internships, and co-op opportunities, there's a website. Um, we have about 200 scientists in-house, and there are about 1,500 users. Those would be professors, postdocs, and graduate students. There are about 150 engineers, 300 technicians, um, 20 people who operate the accelerator, and uh, clear and support administration and management. questions. Yes. Has there been a with the way the economy is working, is there still a steady flow of money to support um kind of science? Any break in science or are you seeing a some cutbacks in regards to to funding? Uh, the question was, do we see funding cutbacks? And uh, the answer is yes. It's, it's been on the order of 5% or so in recent years. So I guess average over a five-year period, about 5%. Uh, so it, it, it means uh, people have to scrimp and save. We can't do quite as much. You know. But this is true across the government. The government is, is trying to uh, pinch its pennies. Other questions? Yes? Could you explain more about the, uh, the black hole, the two stars? <clears throat> well, the black hole is one of the ways a star can end up. And uh, it happens when the star is very massive and it collapses under gravity. You know, the reason the star didn't collapse to begin with is it's hot and it's some pressure that keeps supports it. But then when all the 
uh, fuel is burned out. It's, it's basically undergoing nuclear reactions. And when all that fuel is burned out, uh, nothing supports it anymore, so it collapses under gravity. If it's very massive, it just collapses and collapses and collapses until it goes into this singularity. The black hole is uh, predicted by general relativity. It's a singularity in space-time, and uh, once something goes in, it never comes out. So nothing can escape it. It's also thought that uh, the center of most galaxies have supermassive black holes. They may be like 100 million times the mass of the sun or something. Uh, but they form a kind of uh, center point to uh, around which the galaxy coalesces. You mean by what goes in and never comes out? Uh, well, nothing can escape. For example, light can, cannot escape. So for example, with the Earth, there's an idea called the escape velocity. You can calculate it. It's one of the things you do in first year of physics. And I think it ends up being uh, 26,000 miles an hour. So if you, if you go fast enough from the surface of the Earth, you can get out to infinity. Uh, but not in, in the black hole, there's no, no way to escape. And that's too much uh, gravity. Other questions? Yes? I'm noticing a lot of operators, engineers, technicians, and scientists in very, very little management. How do you get by? Well, it kind of depends on what you call management, because actually a lot of the scientists and engineers that are listed there are actually, they're really managers. So they're managing other scientists or other engineers. Uh, I think what I meant well, the human resources gave me the breakdown, but I think what they meant by management is people who are really with the DOE and their only job is management. DOE is the Department of Energy. Other questions? Yes. If come to you all with problems, or do you all have a, a, a list of uh, experiments that you have to do to solve problems for the world? Or how does that work? Are all, what do you call your customers? Well, the customers are mostly academic institutions. As I show here, there's 1,500 users. So we're a user-based uh, lab. We, uh, you know, we rely on professors coming up with great ideas. So it's mostly professors and the people who work for them in universities. And they're from all over the world. So uh, mostly from the United States, but also Europe and China and Japan. And the way it works is they come with an idea to do an experiment. then they have to justify why it's the best way to use the facility. And they have to compete with other people for the beam time and for the resources. Um, now the lab brings in a, a small group of experts called Program and Advisory Committee. These are internationally uh, acclaimed scientists, and there's about maybe 10 of them. And they have to judge the merits of these proposals. The best proposals win and get the beam time. And it can be from any, any uh, collaboration of professors. Some of the in-house scientists are uh, making proposals as well. But uh, I guess the bulk of the activity comes from outside. Other questions? Yes? Um, you mentioned the Z boson. And I know yeah. that uh, bosons are carriers, of course. So is the Z boson uh, the carrier of the weak force? Yeah, actually one of three is also a W plus and W minus, uh, but it's the neutral one. So it's the one that's relevant here because the electron goes in and comes out with no, no charge change. Yes? You said there was some medical advances from Jefferson Lab. Uh, which one of those? Well, um, one of them I know about is um, people use um, helium for helium three for their targets, and uh, there's some atomic physics associated with that, which allows them to do imaging. So they can they can tell they can get like a picture of your lungs, a, and they can tell something about the health of the lungs. And then there are, there's also detector technology, which uh, can be involved in making better photographs of tissue. Uh, it's, this is not something that's done at the lab, but a kind of general application is, is uh, like what they do at Hampton Proton Therapy uh, Institute where they bombard uh, cancer tissue with protons and that was a spin-off 
of this kind of physics, but actually from proton machines. We're not a proton machine. So that kind of stuff. Other questions? Yes. Um, I know in this slide there's a website for um, that uh, gives information to students for internship. Um, for a Thomas Nelson Community College student who's interested in getting involved in some kind of research program at the level of the students, the personal lab, what do you have to say? What, what, what do they need to do to get involved if they're interested? Well, I this, know there's the, information in the website. Yeah, the website would be a start. Um, when I know about it is they have different summer programs, for example. And like this summer, I had an undergraduate working with me for about two months. And they, they come under their different names of them, like uh, Suli is one of them. Um, and you go for a few months and you work with one of the staff there. Not necessarily a physicist, but it could also be an engineer or somebody in computer science. Depends on what you want to do. And uh, they give you a project, something that you can finish over the summer. And it gives you a taste for what kind of work we do, what, what it's like to do research. The student I had this summer was trying to decide, do I want to go continue in physics or do I want to do engineering? And I'm happy to report at the end he's decided to go to graduate school in physics. I'm not sure how much of an influence I was, but <laughs> but he's continuing. Is there a, a certain criteria that uh, they, they choose the students? I'm not sure exactly how that works. Like, is there some? Um, there's, I think there, there is some um, selection criteria, but I'm not sure how that works. I mean, the main thing is to look into it and uh, if you're interested, to try to apply for it. Uh, Y'all do provide an internship for engineers and physicists. Uh, I mean, oh, yeah. engineering students and physicists. Yeah, I, I tend to always see the physics students, but I, I know some engineering students come through and they have uh, some of the uh, sort of junior level jobs, if you will, in the computer department, like running the help desk is done by students. And so they're just working part time as a student. And they, they know remarkably uh, a lot about computers, and so that's, that's very helpful. But they, they you know, gives them an introduction to the environment, working environment. So it's like a part-time job. Other questions? Well, well I think there's no other question. I'd like to thank the speaker. Thank you.